Well hello everyone and you join us here today to do a little bit of learning. Here are 10 things that you need to know about watches. Good morning Tom. As every day passes, I would say that your watch knowledge is increasing. Would you agree with that? Yes, but you have to offset that against my watch knowledge retention, and <laughs> uh, we're not sure how that's going. Well, I think you've got to the stage where you've learned enough about watches where we can go to that next level, and I can, I can break your mind with some new information that I think you need to know, and other people need to know as well, about watches. Are you prepared for that to happen? Yeah, cool. Lay it on me. All right. Here they are. Number one. Let's get straight into it. Tom, if you were to do a petition of the everyman, who they think the best watchmaker in the world is. What do you think they'd say? The everyman? Hmm. Probably Fossil. Um, <laughs> I imagine if you were to ask people a luxury watchmaker, most of them would know Rolex and as such consider them the best. Would you agree with that? Watchmaker or watch seller? <laughs> I think they're probably the best watch seller. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Rolex isn't the best watchmaker, not by a long shot. I think, Tom, you probably actually know a number of other watchmakers at the same price point that do a better job. Yeah, sure. The famous one's probably Grand Seiko. If we're talking about how well finished they are and how beautifully made they are, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. So from a pure watchmaking perspective, never mind the brand and the cachet around it, you can spend that money and get better watchmaking. Sure. The, the beauty, the artistry, the, um, the skill for that money. And that brings me on to point number two, because one of those brands that you can get better finishing for, for more money than Rolex, is Patek Philippe. And if you were to petition a slightly more select group of people, in the world, they might say that Patek Philippe is the best watchmaker. Do you agree with them on that? I mean, yeah, Patek Philippe, probably one of the best. I mean, they're up there, but there are people out there doing watchmaking at a much higher, more complicated level than Patek Philippe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Patek Philippe is really in the mainstream when it comes to the, the fine art of watchmaking. But you start to dabble a little bit more. The German cousins, uh, Alangenzona, for example, but even then you've got Maurice Grossmann, Langenheiner in Germany too, uh, and other Swiss watchmakers, F.P. Jean, Romain Gautier, Laurent Ferrier, all of those guys are making watches at a higher level than Patek Philippe. So again, depends how far you want to stretch your knowledge, but certainly don't settle for Rolex and definitely don't settle for Patek Philippe thinking they are the best watchmakers in the game. Tom, to, to move on to point number three, I think you would agree with many people that mechanical watchmaking really is the peak. Yeah, that's the most romantic form of time telling, isn't it? And therefore the best. <laughs> You're right in one respect. From that pers from that perspective of artistry and history, it has more that is better about it from an emotional perspective. It connects with you more, doesn't it? It's yeah. just something nice about things that are generally analog and mechanical compared to their digital counterparts. But ultimately, the mechanical movement is flawed, heavily flawed, compared to what's capable today when it comes to timekeeping. Never mind atomic clocks, a $10 quartz movement will keep better accuracy than a mechanical one, will be less susceptible to magnetism and shock, overall will be a better timekeeper. Which brings me on to my next point, that whilst quartz isn't the emotional connector that mechanical is, that doesn't mean it's crap. Yeah. A $10 cheap piece of throwaway plastic is a pretty naff thing. It's not very well made, but that doesn't mean that quartz movements can't be made to a very, very high quality. Have you ever heard of a high quality quartz watch? Yeah, I've seen some. They're quite nice. I think some people, when they think of quartz, they think of, you know, a bit of copper coil wrapped around a thing with a little <laughs> crappy crystal that you might get out of a Christmas cracker. But actually, you know, some of them just look as impressive as any other mechanical movement. I think the big letdown for a quartz movement is always the button battery, isn't it? <laughs> no matter yeah. how Swiss made and expensive your movement is, you're going to put a button battery from Argos in it. Yeah, silver paracetamol in the back of your uh, <laughs> watch movement. But nevertheless, Rolex have made a high-end quartz. 
Mm. Grand Seiko continued to make high-end courts. Juju Lecoult, Patek Philippe, F.P. Jean even make very desirable high-end courts, often with extra little bits of fun and games in there to, to throw a unique spin on how they work, and all certainly with very high-quality finishing, as you said, in comparison to what you'd expect of a mechanical movement. So if quartz is something you like the sound of, you can still get one that is very high-end. Hmm. Tom, um, in any of your hobbies, have you ever noticed something about the increasing amounts that you can spend and how it relates to quality? <laughs> yeah, that's tricky, isn't it? When you're researching something, you go, well, this does everything I need, but this does everything I need, plus a couple more things, but it's ten times the price. <laughs> Yeah, and then if you go up to the next level, it's another 10 times the price for just yet another couple more things. You soon start to realise that those couple of things get even more expensive the more you add. This is the law of diminishing returns, where the more you spend doesn't equate to an equal amount of additional growth. Yeah. So say you had a $10 watch and you had a $100 watch, the difference would be quite significant. If you had a $100 watch and went to a $1,000 watch, you then having to pay 10 times the price again, but a significant difference more to the 10 to $100 to get an increase in quality that doesn't seem to be the same as the value. Same for 1,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 to 100,000, those differences get very small. When you're talking about hundreds of thousands, the difference between a 100,000 watch and a 300,000 watch can be almost imperceptible. Yeah, I'm happy with my Encore violin. I don't need a Stradivarius. <laughs> So the more you spend doesn't necessarily equate to the increase in quality that you're going to expect to get. As you start getting up there into the thousands and potentially even tens of thousands, don't expect each increment to be life-changingly different. Buy them all and then you'll uh, cover all your bases. <laughs> Sage advice. But the funny thing is, Tom, is that uh, you would expect that the amount you spend would relate to the quality that you get, even if it might diminish the more you spend, that Higher cost equals higher quality. Sometimes it's not even about quality at all. It's about the, the name on the dial. You know, if you switch that from one to another, then yeah, you have a huge jump in price. And uh, it's got nothing to do with quality. Yeah, absolutely. Brand, provenance, all of those kind of things can add an enormous amount to the cost of a watch without it actually changing in quality and maybe even being worse quality. A, a vintage Rolex is a pretty rubbish watch by today's standard. Sure. But it's not just true of, of vintage. Um, are you aware of any watch manufacturers that charge a lot of money that don't necessarily offer the quality that you'd expect? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, no, they none of them do that. They all, You all get what you pay for. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish. Um, there are some brands out there. You might recall that the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak's original modus operandi was to be way more expensive than it should be, with its uh, sure. obviously distinctive shape basically showing off the fact that you could pay over the odds for a simple steel watch. That was the idea. It was a show of wealth. That continues today. Brands like Hublot and Richard Mille, they are more about what you look like wearing them than how much value you get for the cost spent. The money that you pay ends up going towards getting those watches on the wrists of anyone out there that can possibly be of value from a, a marketing perspective, Formula One race drivers, tennis players, etc. But you don't necessarily get the quality that you're paying for. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. If you like, say, a Richard Mille or a Hublot, as long as you know that you aren't getting that value for money, if you still want it, you still want it. Yeah. And you're still going to have it. It costs what it costs. Yeah. Tom, let's move into the manufacturing portion of this things you need to know. Yeah. Are you aware of the term in-house and what that means in watchmaking? Sure, yeah. That's when a watchmaker a brand will do everything themselves from start to finish. They'll, they'll sketch out the picture of the watch in MS Paint or something like that, and then <laughs> they will stamp it out on a big sheet of metal and then attach the hands and everything, all themselves, all under one roof. That's certainly the perception, isn't it? Um, and there's a perception that sits alongside that, which is that in-house is better. Right, yeah. Does that sound familiar? The perception of watchmaking is everyone loves the idea of that uh, wizened watchmaker with their white coat um, hunched over their 
bench filing away a little part and they want it all to be this sort of artisanal endeavor that it's all just a really really nice sort of homegrown kind of one-of-a-kind product that you're getting that's been really really attentively made and cared for by this single maison of diligent watchmakers and that's a romantic idea and yeah that's that sounds nice yeah let's do that (laughs) well the reality is slightly different to that in most cases purely for the the benefit of affordability sure the wizened watchmaker making everything by hand in house is an incredibly expensive thing to do and so most watch brands will if they make their movement in house will be making them via cnc machine for the most part yeah oftentimes because in house isn't really a regulated term in any stretch like swiss made is you you have to have 60% of the value of the product made in switzerland to be called swiss made in house completely unregulated that can mean everything from you made every last piece under the roof of your manufacturer to working with external suppliers to supply bits like balance springs, main springs, balance wheels, jewels, even to having an external company design and build a movement for you exclusively that is then assembled by the watchmakers within your factory. Sure. Because it's unregulated, it can mean anything from one sense to the other and doesn't necessarily have the value that people perceive it to have. So if I were to buy in a a full um, calibre movement, say like an ETA, and then engrave my brand name on the road to eight, that, that wouldn't count as in-house. <laughs> not anymore. Shame. But it's not even everything anyway. If you have something made in-house, let's say you had a manufacturer that designed, CNC'd, and then finished their movement in-house. The level of actual handcrafting expertise might be a very small pass at the end. Yeah. Whereas you might find a smaller independent watchmaker buys something like a Veritas and then hand skeletonize it, polishes bevels on it to the highest degree, adds a small complication, does things to it that are incredibly intensive from a handcrafting perspective. Their movement isn't in-house, but is actually a better movement from the perspective of watchmaking artistry and skill than the one that could officially be badged in-house. Absolutely, yeah, sure. So not only does in-house not always actually mean fully in-house, but it doesn't doesn't mean a huge amount anyway in terms of value. Yeah, I don't expect anyone to have to make that big, really long, coily spring that goes in the balance wheel. That's just, (laughs) no, that looks like a headache. You have to start with a very flat piece of metal and then you use the edge of a pair of scissors and run it down it. Yeah, (laughs) just like Christmas. (laughs) And moving into that hand-finished stuff. Hand-finished does not mean the same thing as handmade. Do you know what I mean by that? What do you mean by hand? Would a Dremel multi-tool count as hand or does it have to be a a tool that uses a battery? Would that still count as hand? Using your hand? Well, that's a very interesting point, actually, because... There is everything from using a dumb tool, if you like, a hand file that you push backwards and forwards to having a hand Dremel that you hold in your hand versus a jig and a lever that moves a perfectly placed piece of metal into a perfectly placed moving sander and applies exactly the same thing every time without any skill. Each one takes slightly less skill, slightly less time. All would be considered hand finishing. Handmade, if if you were to have something completely handmade, like a Roger Smith, the team starts with blank pieces of metal and they cut yeah. them out with tools that don't require electricity. Right. Versus the other side of it, where you could have something that is blanks made by CNC that have a finish applied, yes, by hand, but the hand is placing the piece into a jig that is pre-fit and pulling a lever down on a machine that is pre-fit and that there is no margin of error created by the human. That still could be classed as hand-finished. The distinction is huge but often not really well communicated and it's worth doing your research there to find out that you're getting something, if that's what you want, that really is handmade or hand-finished to a degree that is appealing to you. But for the last thing, Tom, number 10, hand-finishing. Many watches, many movements, they don't even get hand finishing at all. 
Right. We touched upon this before. Robots, Tom. <laughs> They're our friends in many yeah. ways. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but they are so capable now that not only can they prepare a blank movement to just the last degree of finishing for hand finishing, including the bevels themselves that then just require hand polishing, they can even polish bevels, apply striping, even assemble movements together. The benefit of being able to have an affordable, attractive movement, because it is made by machine, is not one that we would turn down because the alternative is too expensive. Sure. But it's really about transparency. I think you'd be surprised how much you can spend before you get to a point where handmade means more than just hand assembled. Yeah. And actually the finishing on a lot of semi high end movements can have the appearance of being hand finished, but is actually completely finished by machine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think what we really want is whatever the process, you just want there to be a little bit of care and attention and you want the the endeavor of making a watch to be earnest. You you want a bit of integrity and that you want the, the watchmaker who's making the watch to actually want to make it, to want to have a vision and, and carry that through. Whether or not they have finished it or if it's, you know, stamped out by a robot or whatever, it doesn't matter as long as there was some sort of honourable intention and it wasn't just to, you know, churn out some watches and make a quick buck. <laughs> well, there you go. A very eye-opening conversation. And perhaps you learned something. If you have anything to add to this conversation, please do put it down in the comments below. We're always looking to learn ourselves and it is fascinating to uncover the real secrets of the industry. So there you go. 10 things you need to know about watches. Thank you so much for listening. Please do like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Bye-bye.